Good morning, everybody. Hello to my online students. No matter what time of day you are taking this class. Today, we are going to talk about the illusion of space. This is a principle of design. Uh, we talk about this even in art appreciation classes. So again, this is one of those things that painters and artists utilize. And so I would like to get you guys started by reminding you to please get a new page in your sketchbook ready and take some notes on the illusion of space. There's a couple of diagrams, three, that I want you to draw. So leave a little space for them, um, maybe like half the page or on the side of the page. So just leave a space for those. Just a little warning. Um, oh, also what would really help for this particular lecture and for a sketchbook project number three, which is attached to this lecture, is getting a ruler or some kind of straight edge. So you'll need um, a ruler or some kind of straight edge. Uh, when I don't have a ruler or something, I always use like, um, well, especially if I'm drawing really small, I'll use like a credit card or something, but don't damage it, please be very careful. I don't solicit that, but okay. Um, or uh, let's see, a credit card or the edge of a thick book, as long as of course you don't damage it. There are many things that you could probably carry with you um, to act as straight edges, or you can find pretty easily if you're um, you know, in a bind. Let me know if you need a straight edge. I have a couple tools with me, but um, if you don't have one, just go quickly grab one from the closet right now. Same thing online, folks. Grab a straight edge. Doesn't have to be huge. Um, something six inches or smaller will be fine. And let's get started. <laughs> yeah, I heard one of the students in uh, one of my previous classes just go, uh, <laughs> as soon as he saw the title slide of this, The Illusion of Space, and maybe you're also thinking, um, space, what do you mean? This is 2D design. We're not taking 3D design. What is this? And you would be correct. Some of the most effective designs don't need that extra flair of the illusion of space. And you'll see a couple of examples of how you can create the illusion of space without um, you know, doing perspective drawings, which we will also talk about. But also remember that we talked about uh, remember when we, sorry about that guys, remember when we talked about um, idea generation, where they come from, where ideas come from uh, a couple of lectures ago? Well, some, remember that some projects would be better off, better off not use, utilizing English would be great. Some projects would be better off not utilizing the principle, like, as in you can get your ideas across without having to uh, provide the illusion of space. So I've given you guys something to stew on. Uh, this wonderful meme. You guys know who Kramer is? A couple of you. I know it's okay. Okay. Watch Seinfeld. You don't have to watch the whole thing. Just, you know, watch an episode with Kramer and you will love him. Okay. This is Kramer in the video. So I've given you guys uh, something to think about. Think about 90s music videos. Who's a 90s? Who's who grew up in the 90s here? <laughs> okay. I'm not alone. <laughs> Hey friends, okay, uh, some of you are clearly too young for 90s music videos, but now you can go gain knowledge without wisdom by searching for it on YouTube. Ha, yeah, I know that's funny. Okay, a lot of those music uh, videos, um, I'm thinking Busta Rhymes, Missy Elliott, uh, I think Blink-182 probably did something, but it was mostly hip hop music videos, I'll say. Um, they use the fish eye lens or the fish eye effect like you see here, and it um, makes you appear as if you're in a fish's eye or in a fish's view. So um, yeah, it's just an interesting distortion in perspective. But uh, in hip hop, for example, uh, Busta Rhymes' style especially, that in your face effect that you get from the fish eye lens was very on brand and successful. But for other musicians, it just seemed like an afterthought because um, Busta Rhymes music is very in your face and loud and punchy. Uh, and then something more soft may not need to use it. And they actually overused it a lot. So um, and that is why this meme exists today. But anyway, um, go uh, if you're interested, go look at 90s music videos. Busta Rhymes, Missy Elliott, one of my favorites, some of my favorites. And you'll see this effect and how it affects the, uh, I guess, validity of the song. But like I said, it's not always, this illusion of perspective is not always needed. Oh, so, uh, another 
recording? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, let's talk about the basics then. The basics of perspective is something called linear perspective. This is a system that artists and designers use for projecting um, projecting apparent dimensions of an object, uh, like a 3D object, onto a flat surface. And I'm sure you're gathered that it uses math, but don't worry, we won't do math. We won't make you do math. It's all going to be visual. Yes, you can breathe. It's okay. I know. Math, right? Okay, um, this concept of, uh, or sorry, I guess method of linear perspective was an integral innovation during the Renaissance period. So it's an invention. It truly is. Uh, it's a, a true system that was invented in the olden days in the Renaissance. Um, and what happened, it, it made the illusion of space and distance a very powerful tool because remember in the Renaissance, not everybody could read. So interpreting images was essential part of being part of a community. So if you could understand um, the image or the important parts of an image, which was helped by linear perspective, if you could understand that, that you could be, then you could be a, a social part uh, of the community. So um, linear perspective affected engineering, which you know the Romans were uh, masters at. Um, engineering and architecture, fine arts, uh, even trades like smithing and printmaking. It also impacted philosophy, religion, and even academia. So this simple system of visual communication really pushed um, thoughts, ideas, uh, understanding of things, it pushed it further. So when you fundamentally need to invite a viewer into the space to enforce your design, you will probably have to use the illusion of space, or at least you'll have to push it uh, farther to make a better argument in design. I hope that makes sense. It makes sense to me, but I hope it makes sense to you. <laughs> Does anyone have questions right now? Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. The rational reality that is captured by linear perspective can be seen from this diagram uh, below, or on the slide, I guess. Objects appear larger as they are closer to us, and they seem to diminish in space as they get farther away. So it all quite literally centers on this thing called the horizon line, which is a horizontal, horizon, horizontal line, and it's at the viewer's eye level, and also often the artist's eye level too, because they're the ones drawing and painting. Um, this particular diagram superimposes the uh, lines, those black lines, on the most basic axes of uh, the School of Ath Athens, which is a painting by Raphael, which is the painting you saw previous slide. Uh, both architecture in this painting and the subjects are organized based on those strong diagonal lines. And notice that they all conjoin at the center. Uh, that center point is called the vanishing point. Write that down. Vanishing point, center point. Got it. Okay. Uh, the vanishing point is exactly what it sounds like. It is the point that is farthest in the distance where uh, objects that are farther away seem to like vanish. Uh, the vanishing point is always on the horizon line and it can, you know, it can move. But in this particular example, it's right in the center of the composition. Did you write it down? Vanishing point at eye level on horizon line. Horizon line, excuse me. Yes. Um, farthest point in the distance. Got it. Okay. So we're going to talk about the five parts of linear perspective that I want you guys to both write down and remember. And I want you to draw these diagrams in your ske sketchbook. There are three of them. Um, so give yourself enough space. Get your straight edge out. Do your best. I'm not looking for perfection. I'm looking for understanding. Numero uno. Okay, so when you draw these diagrams, I would start with the horizon line. So draw that line, the, the um, horizontal line. You'll see it in all of these. Uh, and then draw your objects from there. So for this particular one, draw the, the eye level, which is the horizon line. Draw the dot of the vanishing point in the center. Label these things, please. Uh, and then I want you to draw squares uh, above that line and below the line. And then with each corner, don't worry about the like the back ends of the cube yet. I know everyone can draw a cube probably, but um, with each corner of the square, I want you to line your straight edge up with the vanishing point, and then draw a dashed line or a, a, a like a light 
line, don't press so hard, or um, I'll expect you to retrace your cubes with like a, a micron pen or a black pen or something. So just separate those imaginary lines from your actual object. If you're super cool and you get it, um, you can draw other forms too. You can do pyramids, you can do, don't do spheres. That's a little complicated. Maybe, maybe I'll teach you, but it's a little complicated. Do um, images or objects with straight edges. Yes. Okay, so uh, principle number one. Objects appear to diminish in size as they recede into the distance. So objects look smaller as they are farther away. And I'm sure you guys understand this. Uh, the method of perspective drawing is, is very much possible because the rate at which objects appear to vanish, vanishing point, is regular, it can be measured, and it is consistent. And that's, that's, how, um, that's how linear perspective and the science of perspective came to be. That's how it was invented, because some guy noticed it. You know? In other words, distance is convincing because patterns that we recognize in nature are, have been recorded and taught traditionally. Yes. Mm -hmm. Give you guys a second to copy this diagram down. Online students, feel free to pause if you need. Okay, the point number two, principle number two of perspective. The point that objects disappear entirely is called the vanishing point. I know I've, I've already been talking about this a bit. This vanishing point is set on the horizon line, but it's not always in the center. Uh, just like when you're, think about when you're driving down a long stretch of road. You're on I-10 going towards San Antonio, going towards Bucky's, the beacon in the distance. Uh, yeah, okay, so you're driving along a straight road. Uh, the edges of the road, the outsides, even though they are parallel, you know that these edges are parallel for the most part. You know that they're parallel, but in the distance, if you look really, really far away to where the sky meets the earth, it looks like the um, edges of the road come together. They meet at, at a center point. That's your vanishing point. Yeah, but like you know, <laughs> but like you know the road doesn't end like that. You know, the, you, the edges of the road don't actually come together. You know this, right? So um, this is just the illusion that was noticed and recorded and now is taught to you. Cool, right? So cool, I know, it's really simple. <laughs> okay, number three, as I just mentioned, this vanishing point should be placed on the horizon line, which is eye level to both artist and viewer. Yes, so as human beings, um, we have a consistent horizon line when we are at ground level, um, as in we're standing on the ground. <laughs> yes, and so your horizon line changes when you're, let's say on a mountain or on the top floor of a skyscraper or um, standing at the bottom of a pool, I guess. Uh, your, your horizon line changes, but generally, as we, as we speak generally, our horizon line is at our eye level. Mm -hmm. Okay, number four. I know, I'm sorry, I'm going fast. I'm sorry. You guys ready? Okay, number four, principle number four of perspective. Because proportional relationships shift with each viewer position change, a fixed viewer is needed to create a believable linear perspective. Let me say it again. Since proportional relationships between objects will shift as a viewer changes their position, a fixed viewer is needed to create a believable linear perspective. So that's why when we, um, that's why what, what I just said, when, when we talk about linear perspective, it is always assumed, unless otherwise noted, that you, the viewer and the artist, are standing on level ground, not in a mountain, not on top of a skyscraper. We're all just, you know, ground dwellers, I guess. <laughs> We're standing on the ground. But of course, these rules can be bent and changed once you master them. So we'll talk about it in a minute. So uh, example, Peter Pan, he can fly. Uh, he has a different view of the world that we don't usually get. 
but we don't we don't not really understand. Well, we do, I guess, because we've all been in most of us, I guess, have been in an airplane. But Peter Pan has a different under, understanding of perspective in the world because he flies mostly to get around. Uh, and so that means that his horizon line, uh, it shifts more than ours. So if he's flying over a city, Peter Pan, and looking down at it, he's going to look, he's going to see uh, mostly one point perspective if he's flying parallel to the earth, um, which we'll talk about in a minute, what he'll see. But his horizon line is like nowhere near the horizon. It's like cutting through the earth, if you can think spatially for a second. Um, but if he looks up a little bit, his horizon line is probably much lower. You, you guys probably get it. His view of buildings is, which is the easiest thing I can talk about right now. His view of the cityscape, the city skyline is very different as he flies around versus if he's walking on the ground. Okay, enough. <laughs> okay, last one. The fifth principle of, uh, perspective. The fifth principle of perspective is called the cone of vision, not to be confused with cone of shame that you put on your cat so he doesn't lick his belly or whatever. <laughs> yes. Do you guys ever notice how much Disney makes its way into these classes? I guess that says a lot about me. No shame. No shame. Okay. <laughs> Okay, the cone of vision is, is it represents the volume of seeing capability. Um, this means that if you're trying to depict a very large, expansive space, you're going to have to move pretty far backwards away from your space to get it all in your cone of vision. So imagine if you do wear a cone of shame everywhere you go um, and they're attached to your eyeballs, I guess, and uh, it's a cone. So it projects out toward the, the viewing area, I guess, I don't know, and pretend like you had to walk around with this, this cone in front of your face all the time. If you um, want to see a whole cityscape, you cannot stand right in front of a building downtown. You have to go back into Buffalo Bayou Park or something far away so that you can take it all in because you have a cone in your face. Make sense? <laughs> okay, so cone of vision is uh, something uh, like a like a vocabulary term, I guess. I hope you have copied that diagram down in your sketchbook, but if you haven't, it's still here. Um, in person, folks, I am going to, as always, post these things on D2L for you. I mean, I'm recording this lecture so you can listen to it all over again in all of its glory if you wish. Um, but online students, feel free to pause this as needed so you can copy what you need. Let me know if you have questions. All right, uh, one point perspective. This is um, one method out of the three that we're going to talk about. Uh, this means that the drawing and the view will only have one vanishing point, hence one point perspective. Uh, this is how our eyeballs see a straight on view of a scene. Um, let me, how do I explain this? If you were to draw a cube like one of these, in the center of your one point perspective diagram, so if your cube edges were equidistant from that vanishing point, meaning it's not off center at all, it's directly on center, then if, if that was the case, you wouldn't see any of the other edges of the cube. I hope that makes sense. So you see the, the face, the front face of that cube, you see it straight on. That's usually the effect that is achieved um, through one point perspective. So in this diagram, you see the full front faces of those cubes. They're all equal in length, even though they may not appear to be so, uh, but they're not skewed really in any way. Everything behind the front face is a little bit skewed. Yes. Okay, so the perspective lines, which um, I'm going to mention that a lot, but the perspective lines, what I mean by that is those uh, imaginary dotted lines that help you meet your corners to the vanishing point. So, I mean, of course, in life, we don't see those, but um, in, in these diagrams, sometimes they're not erased and it's actually kind of nice. So uh, that's what I mean when I say perspective lines, just, just a little heads up. Um, okay, perspective lines all converge to that single central vanishing point or it doesn't have to even be central, it, they converge onto a single vanishing point. 
and remember that it's always on eye level. As you can see, we can view the other sides of these cubes, or whatever forms, as they are depicted above or below or away from the center vanishing point. So moving your cube away from the vanishing point, up, down, left, or right, whatever, um, it's, it's going to affect the amount of that particular volume that we see. Yes. Okay, so an example is also on this slide. The drawing to the right it has a single vanishing point, but where is it? Where do all the lines appear to converge? Yes, yes, in that arch on the top right corner. You can see all the lines kind of like going toward that, that point. So um, actually, let's blow it up a little bit bigger. Hang on one second while I, I get that ready. Okay, much better. See the vanishing point underneath the arch on the right side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, top right corner. Uh, you can see all those lines meet at a little, like, kind of like a dot. Yeah. Okay. Um, another way that you can identify this is look at the tiles on the floor. They are all, of course, parallel with one another, as you know, but they appear to get closer together and smaller the farther away they get. So that's not actually happening in reality. It's just the illusion. Um, you can, um, yeah, if you, I'm glad I blew this up a little larger. You can see the dashed perspective lines. Yeah, so those are, those are typically erased, like they get erased after a drawing is done, but um, these are here still. I think they're kind of beautiful. I always keep them. When I was in architecture school, I always kept them in my drawings. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, cleaned them up and erased them a little bit, but it kind of gives that... Um, this was made by hand and I used my brain to do this. <laughs> gives, it gives it that kind of feel. Okay. Um, uh, oh yeah, you can also see, look at this box on the bottom left corner. It looks like it's transparent, right? Because you can see the dashed lines that represent the inside of the box. Yes, but I mean, the draftsman clearly wanted it to appear solid. They just had to use, um, how, how do I say this? Let's just say that every single thing is considered when drawing perspective. So I know you don't see the bottom corner, the back corner of that box, but in order to make your, um, your environment believable, you still have to consider it and make sure it lines up with your um, vanishing point. Okay, one point perspective is very, um, it's one of the simplest. And I think if you draw uh, a couple of things, you can try drawing block letters, like you can try drawing your name in block letters and putting it in one point perspective. And you just line up your straight edge with the corner of each, um, each corner of your letter and then with your vanishing point. And you'll see, you'll see how pretty, how easy it is. Start with cubes, go to rectangles, do letters, you know, fish tanks, <laughs> which is a rectangle. <laughs> yeah, this one, this one is pretty simple to get. And I, I really, I think you guys actually, I know, I know y'all can do it. So just practicing your sketchbook. It's kind of fun. It's an easy thing to do when you're bored and don't know how or what to draw or, you know, where to get started. Okay, let's move on. Next in our lineup, you guessed it, it is two point perspective. So this means instead of one point, there will be two vanishing points on the horizon line. See, we got a new, a new diagram. This is one of, a, one of the ones I want you to copy down. Make sure to label everything. Two point perspective um, in two point perspective. If you were to draw the same cubes, this means that none of the cubes will have any lines that are parallel to this horizon line. So first, basically the tops and bottoms of the uh, cubes were parallel to that eye level horizon line, but now we're looking at everything like from the corner in uh, two point perspective. This type of drawing really pushes the potential for movement through a space. And so um, you'll see many faces every, every time you'll see two or more faces of an object. Uh, so it's very often used in architecture because this is how they use, um, this is how they make their renderings to um, immerse the viewer, to give the viewer a sense of how the space would be used or how a, a building should be viewed, 
etc. Here is an example. Uh, this is a drawing by one of my personal favorites, Frank Lloyd Wright. This is his drawing of Falling Water, which is a home that is literally built on a waterfall in Pennsylvania. Yes, the water doesn't actually run through the house. It's below it, uh, but it's the floor is the bedrock. You can walk on the rock <laughs> where the waterfall is. It's pretty cool. Um, this also is one of those like super popular Lego architecture, <coughs> excuse me, Lego architecture kits. So I'm sure y'all have seen it walking through the Lego section at Target. Ooh, sorry about that. Um, okay, Frank Lloyd Wright was a master draftsman. He was skilled at transforming 2D designs into 3D space and also back again. So um, I have lots of books of his drawings and these drawings, these perspective ones are not the only beautiful thing that he does. Um, even his architectural plans are full of detail and full of artistic, um, okay, detail. They're full of artistic details. And, um, hmm. Yeah, and what I mean by he went 2D, 3D, and then back again is he would clearly start with uh, like a system, a grid system um, for creating these buildings, and then he would build them in and design them in 3D. And then he would also include things like uh, inlays and stained glass, which are 2D uh, renderings of materials, and he would put them back into his design, which is a very modern thing. And I'm sorry, I'm being a nerd. Okay, let's go back. Okay, so if you have ever looked at Frank Lloyd Wright, um, if you haven't, I guess, um, do a quick search. You'll see just by looking at his work that a lot of contemporary design, like Ikea stuff and um, what's that place called? Urban, urban, industrial, I don't know. But a lot of design uh, stores and home stores and furniture stores have a lot of uh, craftsman stuff that's inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright and his style. Okay, anyway, there are no perspective lines in this drawing that you can really see, he erased them. Uh, but the edges of the house, the tops and bottoms, give you hints as to where the horizon line and vanishing point are. So um, let's see, the faces of the balconies on the right side, the most right facing part of this composition, um, imagine the uh, parallel lines kind of running toward the right edge of the paper and the vanishing point where they meet is off the page quite a ways. And then the left, the left vanishing points are shorter. So if you, if you continue those left facing lines all the way back to a place where they would meet together, they're not as far away as the other side. I hope that makes sense. Can I draw on this? Maybe I can. Uh, let's try. Okay, so vanishing point. Oh, let me draw a picture actually. Pen. Yeah, okay, this is not going to be pretty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's the left side, vanishing points. And then the right side. Oh, hey, I'm not, I'm not too bad. Okay, yeah, I spoke too soon. I'm pretty bad. <laughs> I'm so sorry if this gives you anxiety. I'm so sorry. Okay, so um, we'll say that these this side maybe converges like right here, and then um, these converge way off the page. But you can tell that there's no parallel lines to the horizon line. So we'll just pretend that the horizon line is like somewhere down here. Uh, we're standing in a waterfall. This is water here. We're standing below the horizon line, so that's why we can see the bottoms um, of these balconies and things. I hope that makes sense, you guys. Sorry for my wonderful drawings. It's really hard to draw on this thing. <laughs> I'm just using my finger and touchpad. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, so speaking of that, so since we're standing down here, what am I doing? Okay, uh, since we're standing down here at the bottom, which is where this wonderful angel a thing that I just drew is uh, remember that cone of vision that we talked about. The architect here shortened the cone of vision so that we don't see those two vanishing points. And his intention was to give the viewer a sense of majesty, um, really, you know, highlight the majesty of his home, his design, which is inside a foresty enclosure. And so that means that that extra information over here, like the vegetation and all the extra rocks and stuff, it's really not needed. 
the, because the the focus is the house and the waterfall. So that was that was definitely a design decision. All of these things were design decisions. Okay, anyone ready for another headache? <laughs> Don't freak out. It's okay. I'm not going to make you master these. It's fine. Okay, so in one point and two point perspective, the lines that represent height are perpendicular to the horizon line. In one point and two point perspective, again, the lines that re represent height are perpendicular to the horizon line. So um, the edges of the cubes on the two diagrams in the right, which you have drawn in your sketchbook already, um, if you extend those lines, okay, I have to draw again because that was kind of fun. If you extend these lines all the way down <laughs> to cross the horizon line, they create these 90 degree angles um, with the horizon line. So um, all the edges, even though my lines are horrendously crooked, all of the edges of your forms will create 90 degree angles with the horizon line. However now, however, in three point perspective, we've added another vanishing point and that vanishing point is either above or below eye level. And so what this does is tilt the entire environment and it gives us um, something like Peter Pan's unique perspective. Um, this is also called bird's eye view. Peter Pan can have a bird's eye view or worm's eye view. So if you're, you know, a worm sticking your head out of the ground, I think that's weird. But okay, <laughs> bird's eye view, worm's eye view. And so this particular drawing on the left in the diagram, which I hope you are copying down, uh, this would be considered a worm's eye view since we are in the viewpoint of um, below, below us like a, how do I say this? We're in the position of a worm. We are laying down on the ground or we're in the ground or we're in a pool or something like that under the ocean. And we're looking up, and so our, our horizon line is definitely above our heads instead of normal um, eye level. But it doesn't have to be that complicated. I know. I know. It was very complicated. <laughs> um, okay, but there, you guys know this. There are other ways to make a convincing argument of space and the illusion of space without being a master draftsman. You know that. So we're going to talk about five, and I want you to write these down too. Another way to, uh, yes, please actually do write these down because you're going to use them for sketchbook assignment three. Pay attention. Take your headphones out of your ears. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> no, I believe you. It's okay. It's okay. I get it. I got to have them too. Okay. Uh, the first way to create convincing space without using linear perspective at all is by overlapping objects. Overlap. Um, this is the simplest, but it's very powerful um, also when it's combined with number three, which is definition. We'll talk about it in a second. So um, this particular painting by Rogier van der Weyden uses overlap and value, which you know, helps with definition, um, uses overlapping of subjects and forms to create the convincing drama within this very crowded and cramped compositional space. So you can see that Christ in the center is not only the central focus, but is basically in front of everyone else. You know, people are holding him up. Um, he's being taken down from the cross. His body also contains the most variation of darks and light values. So he, uh, well, everyone has like the same darks and light values, but his, the, the shadows on his are darker compared to the lights on his body. I hope that makes sense. Um, but you could also say that his position in space competes with Mary's, who's on the bottom left in the blue. You see that really dark blue shadow under her dress? Yeah, that's, that's something that pulls your eye downward. Uh, and so um, she also could be considered the front most subject in this composition, especially because she's the lowest in the composition. She's the one closest to the bottom. The second way to create the illusion of space is size variation. And we will revisit the School of Athens, the painting by Raphael, for this one. 
Uh, Raphael makes us believe in the vastness of this space and the great distance toward that vanishing point in the center through the lining up of architecture and subjects, as in people, along those imaginary lines. Plato and Aristotle are the two men in the center, and they appear smaller than the folks up front. So a general rule of thumb is that larger objects appear closer to the viewer and smaller objects appear farther away. Vanishing point. Got it? Okay. All right. Uh, let's zoom into this painting. Do, 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 do. Uh, sorry, I had to cover up the um, list of five things. Um, but I wanted to zoom in so that we could talk uh, more clearly about the third, which is definition, which is like the details, the sharpness of details. That's what that means. Uh, there's an actual, sorry, this painter, this landscape painter is named Albert Bierstadt. There's a, an actual Bierstadt painting at Houston Christian University, uh, previously Houston Baptist University, but it's in their fine art museum. It's a very beautiful landscape of a really sublime mountainscape. That was a lot of scape words. Um, <laughs> but if you're ever like near the Galleria, the Houston Christian University is the art room, the art building is open all the time. It's open to the public, uh, maybe just not on weekends. So feel free to go by. It's free. It's, you know, something to do. Use someone's AC for a second. Yeah. And then you can look at fantastic paintings like this, master paintings like this. Okay. So uh, let's pretend that we're in this landscape. This is near the Rocky Mountains. Has anyone ever been? Hmm. Quite a few of you guys. Oh my gosh. Cool. Okay. Um, well, uh, I don't have to really lecture you guys much on this, but uh, notice how the mountains in the top really look like, you know, well, I guess it's kind of a stretch, but they kind of look like a Patagonia t-shirt. Uh, they're kind of bluish as they get farther away. That's not smog. It's not smoke. It's quite literally moisture particles in the air getting in your way and blurring your vision. It's kind of like a, like a not dense cloud. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that atmosphere is it blurs our perspective. It blurs our vision. So this, the, um, the third uh, method that you could use to um, create the illusion of space without using linear perspective is by changing the, the intensity of your definition. Uh, and so things in the distance do not have as much definition as things closer to you. The farther away something is, the less definition it has, the more blurry it can be, the less focus you have to really pay to those details in the distance. So um, artists and designers like Bierstadt will depict things with very sharp detail uh, to either like draw attention to it, like that very brightly lit waterfall, or to make it appear closer to us. So these rocks in the bottom left corner are very defined. You can see individual rocks, you can see the shadows, uh, but you can't really see rocks that are very much present on those mountains out there. And there's no need to do that because we, because Bierstadt doesn't want us to look necessarily at the detail of those. He just wants to give us an illusion of space. Yes. So a little tip for you landscape painters out there. If you want to make a convincing landscape painting, or drawing, um, don't try to paint every single blade of grass or every leaf. Trust me. Leave that for like, leave your focus for like five leaves <laughs> near the bottom of your canvas or, or whatever you're using. Please don't sweat the details. Um, there's actual beauty in restraint and not painting all the details. Like it's cool and you have talent and stuff, but a very successful convincing landscape painting uh, omits a lot of the details. Bob Ross will tell you that. Bob Ross knows. Okay. <laughs> so that brings us to our next spatial tool. It is location. Generally understood that distant objects are placed near the top of the composition and closer things are more toward the bottom. See? Mountains on top, animals on bottom, clearly different areas of uh, location in space. And finally, color. You guys already know this from your color studies, but uh, to review, contrast in hue, contrast in value, 
uh, temperature changes can also enhance the illusion of space without using linear perspective. So, um, or it, you know, it can push your linear perspective if you if that's something you want to use. So check out these bright uh, plants in the bottom left corner of this landscape. The contrast is so strong there. So behind all of those bright yellow and purple and blue um, petals and leaves, it's like super blurry and kind of muddy, the paint there. And there's really not a lot of information there. It's just kind of fuzzy. But the contrast of hue, value, and temperature of those colors is so strong that even among all of that blankness, that abstract blankness of that area, we still detect that those uh, plants are closest to us. To share this one with you too. Here's some real world stuff. Uh, sometimes Houston hosts a sidewalk chalk and like a mural art combo festival where they invite some artists who really, really push the possibilities of this principle of space and the illusion of space. Images here are of the same artwork, but depending on what angle, the angle in which, at which you view it, so if you're standing on the side or in front of it, the more or less distorted the image becomes. If you stand at the end of the mural, you'll see that those golden Lego figures appear to stand right in front of you, but at the side, the image is very stretched out and it is almost recognizable. So these artists have really mastered this understanding of the illusion of space. And what they've done is on the pavement, they have drawn and painted these really stretched, distorted um, images with the understanding that if you stand at a certain spot, it will be very convincing and it will look really lifelike. So let me show you another one. Here's another one with some process images. So the two images on the right, the smaller ones, this is the artist working on his painting. Um, so they're very clearly planned out. They're very clearly measured and planned out. Uh, and then the image on the left is the finished result with some pedestrians standing at a very appropriate space but so like obviously there's not an icy hole in the sidewalk here it's just chalk but isn't that amazing that is so amazing like this is a really huge drawing it's really long you can tell by like the um the pylons on the left side like how far the drawing goes back in the distance wow so yeah this these artists like these really understand perspective and how it affects um humans and so they draw these at foot level quite literally on the horizon and so if we stand back at a certain point you'll get cool crazy pictures like this Isn't that cool i want to go so next time the um chalk festival comes back you should go take some cool pics talk to the artists please talk to the artists all right it is your turn so um if you're in class, go ahead and open your sketchbook to a new page, and we're going to start on sketchbook assignment three. If you're online, you can start whenever you're ready. Remember, these sketchbook assignments are due all in one lump at the end of the class, and I will, I'll will i tell you exactly how I want you to submit them, but just work on them now so you don't have to cram and panic later. Do a good job. Learn something, you know. <laughs> All right, so let's explain it. Sketchbook assignment three is going to be all about perspective, but I'm not going to make you do linear perspective. I'm not going to make you do a vanishing point or anything um, that might come later with your next project, but we'll see. Uh, so in a new page in your sketchbook, what I want you to do is draw a group of common household objects and make a convincing illusion of space. So remember that list of five things that we just talked about about how you could create the illusion of space without using linear perspective. Um, you can make one single drawing to achieve this, or you can make multiple drawings, separate drawings to achieve this, as long as you success successfully use these three things. You have to use overlap, you have to use the variation of size of the objects, and you have to use location of the objects. So you're gonna use those three methods to create a convincing illusion of space and you're just going to do use common household objects to to draw that does that make sense 
Okay. Yes, you're going to put them at all different distances in space. There's, yeah, there's really no limit to how many objects you draw. I mean, you, I, I guess you have, you have to have three at least, <laughs> I guess. Um, some examples. Hmm, that's a good question. Some examples that I have seen that have been successful are um, produce, like what you see here, apples, fruits, vegetables, fresh things, eggs. Um, try not to use eggs. Yeah, they're pretty boring. I mean, they're they're white things and they're they have like value contrast, but they're not very textured. So um, avoid avoid super simple objects. Uh, don't here's what I, here's what I don't want you to use. Don't use pens because those are just sticks basically. Don't use um, anything that is too complicated like a wrapped up cord. I mean, unless you feel like you can go go for it. Scissors are kind of hard too. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. trying to think of other things don't use like phones or tablets or whatever those are too simple and they're also pretty flat um, let me give you an example of some some things that other people have used produce like I said uh, this one person did interesting bottles that they had in their I guess in their cabinet or something but they had different shapes bottles of different shapes some were square some were darker than others uh, I've seen shoes done before. That was actually pretty complicated, but they did it. Uh, makeup brushes and makeup bottles, because, you know, they're little and di different shapes. Tools. I've seen tools done. And plants. Plants are kind of complicated, too. Um, yeah, they're kind of complicated, too, but that's okay. Yeah, try, try to make them pretty realistic. Don't draw cartoony stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're going to actually like set these items in front of you. Um, you can take a picture of them if you want and draw from photograph or you can draw like a still life where you're actually looking at the objects like how like this painting right here on the screen. You can use any materials that you want to make this assignment as long as it is on a clean and unlined piece of paper. Don't do it on notebook paper. Don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, avoid graph paper. Avoid isometric graph paper, too. I want you to, to, to do this by hand. Yes, no cheaty, cheaty. Email me pictures. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can, you know, if you're working on this on the weekend or on my online folks, if y'all want to send me pictures, if you're like, oh, my God, I don't know. Is this right? I don't want to get a bad grade at the end or whatever. If you want to email me pictures, that's totally fine. Yes. Yes. I, I'll do my best. I'll do my best to respond to you. I'll get, I will get back to you, of course. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you guys for your attention. Um, I hope that you're not too confused about all these different things. Feel free to reaccess this video on D2L if you have questions or email me. Work with your friends. You guys never cease to impress me by the collaborative work that you guys do. Yeah, I hear I hear you guys. I hear y'all talk and teach each other. I, I really enjoy that. So um, reach out to your peers, consult the internet, and then of course, use me, I'm a resource. So email me. All right, uh, y'all have a great day. Online folks, please reach out to me if you need anything at all. And I'll talk to y'all soon.